G'day, everyone. For those who came in late, you're listening to Expand, the fandom podcast. Please subscribe to us via your favourite podcast player or YouTube, and do not forget to leave a review. 500 years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The man come. the ghost who walks, the man come. enemies beware, the phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. He finds. So yes, we are the X-Band, the Phantom Podcast from Chronicle Chamber. Our website is chroniclechamber.com and you can contact us via email, chroniclechamber at gmail.com. My name is Steve and today I'm joined by both Jermaine and Dan. G'day, fellas. How are you today? Good, good. It's good to have the band back together, right? It is good. Um, hey, Dan, you're looking wild and woolly there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I am. Um, I can't remember. I've told on the podcast, I'm sure, the story of why I'm growing my hair, which is because we've got um, my school's a boarding school that, that I teach at, and I've got kids uh, up in Cape York who uh, dared me to grow my hair from the normal bald um, from the moment they went into quarantine, and they still haven't come back uh, from COVID. So I'm still growing the hair, but I'm actually going up this weekend uh, on a bit of a trip up to Cape York to see if I can find. Uh, the kids and show them this and convince them to come back to school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so hopefully by the time next podcast, I'm back to normal. <laughs> yes, please convince them. Cause, oh, my goodness. I, I just thought the winter must have hit Queensland. You'd have to, have to you know, actually grow a winter coat. Well, we need to keep the winter going for a while while we've got all the footy up here, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hot come grand final. <laughs> that's, if, yeah. that's if it's played up there. It might be played over here, yeah? yeah it's not yeah. going to be played down here, that's for sure. <laughs> no. No, so Stephen, quick question. I know you're not in Melbourne, and Melbourne's where the main COVID is. So, have have we like got rid of everyone? Is Melbourne like just not part of Australia yet? Is Ben uh, you know, Ballarat <laughs> now the capital city of Victoria? Do you classify yourself still as a Victorian, or are you? Now- oh, very much so. We're, there's an iron curtain that's been put up between um, on the Western Freeway that that separates Ballarat from uh, from Melbourne. It's, uh, it's between uh, Melton and, and Bacchus Marsh. Um, but we still, just in case a Melbourne person, there we go. I don't know if you can hear me. Hmm. But just in case a Melbourne person seeps through, not just a Melbourne person, it's not just Melbourne people. There's a... <laughs> a shout out to all our poor Melbourne listeners who are stuck at home during COVID. Mm. Uh, our thoughts are with you. Our thoughts are with everyone from around the world. Mm. Um, who is, you know, uh, me and Dan are lucky. We're in very lucky states, but uh, a huge shout out to everyone who is not in a lucky area. Uh, we're thinking of you. Uh, mm-hmm. hope, hopefully you enjoy the podcast and we're going to have some fun tonight. So, And, I, and, and on that note, um, I'd just like to a special shout out to past podcast guest, Ohm Roy, um, episode 101 or 102, something like that. Um, who we, I only discovered today actually um, had caught COVID himself about a month ago and uh, or more and uh, has recovered, but um, was very generous uh, when I was able to stay at his place and, and he showed me through his phantom collection and, and we had that on the podcast. And uh, so, you know, obviously the pod, you know, a, a little bit of a personal touch there for, for us and for me. So um, I am to you um, and to anyone else who's uh, suffering in any way. Uh, because of what's going on in the world, um, we we wish you all the very best, as Jim said. Yeah, sure. Anyway, Phantom's world, everyone around the world, that sort of links to the topic for the day, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, a bit of a segue there. <laughs> all right, so Dan, you're doing this bit, remember? Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Um, I thought we would talk about the fact that we were doing... Okay. So we're, we're, today's podcast is, is really well organized, but uh, we forgot to put in a sentence to say exactly... You've read the topic of the podcast. We're talking about Phantom's World. Here it is, episode uh, issue 12, the last issue. Um, we're talking about the, the Phantom's World series that was brought to us by Fru. Um, 12 comics in a regular series and, and some others, and we'll explain all of that. Um, it was it launched back in August of 2016, um, yesterday, four years ago, as we record this, 
Um, it was a new concept that was released by Fru. And it, the, the point of it was to showcase stories from all around the world um, that uh, regular Fru readers in Australia wouldn't have seen. So stories uh, were sort of sold to us as stories from, it was going to be all around the world and they started in Italy. Italy um, and uh, it was the first time lots of these stories were even published in English. Um, it's, as I said, it's been four years to the day almost as we record this and the series has stopped, as I said, number 12, the last one. Um, and so we thought we might have a bit of a look at the series in uh, retrospective. So um, we want to just show you the covers here. Steve's going to bring this up because he's the master of share screening now that he's uh, teaching from home. <laughs> uh, so Steve, if you can bring, you have, good work. Um, so that's the, those are the covers of Phantom's World. Uh, through regular issue 1761 was the first Phantom's World issue as a single story. And uh, following it not long after were issues 1770 and 1771, also labelled Phantom's World, um, but part of the regular Fru series. About halfway through 2017, um, Fru was having a lot of their own stories being created to go into the regular series. So the decision was made uh, to extend Phantom's World to a separate series and become uh, what became these 12 issues of uh, 100, page story, uh, 100 page comic books with, uh, well, as few as one and as many as I think five or six stories that we hadn't seen before um, that were published originally in non-English speaking countries. Um, they were released four times a year. And so we ended up with the 12. They were part of a subscription that you could get uh, your um, universe cards with if you wanted. Um, the first one, as I said, was released on the 25th of August, 2016. And we've stopped with this one here. So hence, we want to have a look back at it. Germ, on to you. Yeah, thanks for that, man. Um, so as Stephen keeps flicking through those, so um, so in total, there was 43 stories out of the 15 uh, issues of comics. Um, majority of them we had never seen before. Uh, this includes multiple part stories, like the Queen of Saba, which actually had three parts. Uh, and that was in issues uh, five six and seven, the Saba uh, issues. And then we also had a couple of other parts and ongoing stories as well. So a further breakdown of the stories are 31 of the 43 were previously published stories. So 29 of those were for Telly Sparta stories. Uh, two of those stories were actually published uh, by RGE, which is Brazil, and also uh, Charlton. And then there's been 12 stories that are new and that have never, ever been published prior. So that includes a couple by, um, uh, a couple by um, Angela Tadera and also Felmang as well. So, that, um, so a couple of those were Expedition of the Jungle, which was uh, issues 170 and 1771 of the regular ones. Um, and then also from Phantom's World Special, number four, which um, is the Hong Long Kidnapping, part one and part two. Uh, something interesting about um, uh, Expedition in the Jungle, part one, is that was actually uh, completed... Um, no, so, yeah, so that was created back in 1973, 74. But then Ferry, uh, who was the artist on part one, actually stopped working on... So he never actually completed part two. Um, and then around two, the year 2000, Ferry and Filmane completed the second part, which is this, this one here. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see that. Um, and then uh, it basically stayed uncompleted until it... Um, uh, until Fru published it. And that, again, is very similar as the case with this issue, which is the Angela Todera one, which featured um, uh, his Hong Long special, that one. Was it the Hong Long special? Sorry. Um, yeah, that's the yeah, yeah. So the Hong Long one was actually created uh, years, I think up about a dozen years before it was actually published and then Fru created it. And I believe that was also very similar as kidnapped and signed fuel as well. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, Dokey. So one of the things that many people loved about this series was the range of writers and artists that many free readers had never seen before. 
Um, and unfortunately, many of the creators are, are unnamed, but some of the creators through readers um, had never seen before include, now, drum roll to see how we go with the pronunciation here. This is why <laughs> I've, I've been given the job and not Jim. <laughs> Angelo Todaro, uh, Osvaldo Grassetti, Giovanni Fior... Fiorenti, uh, Giovanni Fiorentini, Senor Pratesi, Antonio Sciotti, uh, Raul Ra uh, Buzelli, Mario Pedrazzi, uh, Ra oh, he's in there twice. Santo oh, D'Amico, uh, Dino Leonetti, Frank uh, Varola, Giorgio Cambiotti, uh, sorry, Cambiotti, no, I've pronounced that one. I've, no, I've pronounced that one wrong. Um, <laughs> Anibal Casabianca, Jose Menendez, uh, Walma Amaral. I want to say that might be a, a V pronounced for the W here. Vandale Mahaye, Mahe, Mayhew, Joe Gill. Yeah, I think we got that one right. <laughs> Unless it's Joe Jill, and then I'm really stuck. <laughs> and Pat Boyette. Um, now, this list, of course, didn't include Falmang or Germana Ferreri or Peter Anderson, who had previously, previously published Phantom Stories. Okay, quite a list there of people who we hadn't um, seen before or heard of before. Um, I think did will we ever hear job. of them again now, though? Sorry, what was that? I think you did a very good job in pronouncing those names. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do think we gave the job to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one thing I will say is it's definitely, like I'm talking to a lot of art collectors and after Phantom's World, there's a lot more people looking at original Fratelli Sparty art to buy because they like what they saw in Phantom's World. Mm. So... Um, yeah, just th so I think in answer to your question, Stephen, will we ever see them again? I hope so. Um, I'm, I, I really enjoyed this series purely because of that, because we've been, I've been able to be educated a lot more on phantom comics from around the world that have been published prior. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we've been able to see these stories from around the world. But what about the actual quality of these stories, the art and the plot and, and what have you? What do you reckon, Dan? Have, have they been I can um, absolutely, high standard? Or yeah, I can absolutely see why Jermaine would say that people uh, have picked up these stories and flicked through them. And anyone who's a, a phantom art collector, uh, I can see why their interest would be piqued by these because um, the particularly the Fratelli Sparta stories, I suppose, um, the Italian artists are pretty renowned and that company is pretty renowned for wanting to chase people who can, who can uh, draw or illustrate in the style of Cy Barry. Um, Cy Barry is um, very typically most people's favourite Phantom artist and um, if you can pick up work that looks like his and is still original and, and has, its own, um, has its own quirks and whatever and is part of a story, especially one that's been now published in, in English that we can see, I can absolutely see why people are chasing that art because there's some mm. beautiful work in it. Um, particularly the the stories that um, Glenn Ford it would have been who has sort of handpicked and put um, Phantom's World together. Um, I think the stories that he picked um, are, are beautifully drawn for the yeah. most part. Um, Ninety percent of them, um, I've really quite loved the art, and uh, I'm unashamedly a Cy Barry fan, and um, I love the way that people have taken this off. And, and I include Phil Mang in that. He's um, he's got a, a, a big chunk of the stories in. Um, Phantom's World, um, and would be the, certainly the most famous artist that we're aware of to contribute to Phantom's World, and so, um, but but he has he would you know started in the style of Cy Barry as well before he's developed his own, which is similar but unique. So um, yeah, in terms of the quality of the art, couldn't fold it. It was um, beautiful to, to to look at. Mm. I, I I agree totally. The art, I think. Um... I think all of the stories bar when I was rereading re them for this podcast, probably there was maybe two stories where the art quality was not as high. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's just because they scanned it out of a comic rather than, and you know, the person who scanned it didn't do a good job or maybe the Fratelli Sparta ones. I've got a comic here. So this is a Fratelli Sparta comic 
This is the French version, as you can see, if you're on YouTube. They're all in colour. So the ones that we saw were in black and white. So maybe, and as you can see, a lot of them are quite smaller. So I'll just do a size comparison. Mm. Um, so maybe the the scan just wasn't it's as quite good. A size, isn't it? Yeah, just a little bit lower for us, Jim. Um, yeah. So you know maybe yeah. So maybe the the scan quality wasn't as good, or or when you turn it to black and white, uh, it lost mm. some of its features in to be black, uh, from colour to black and white. But apart from one or two stories, you can I could not fault the art. The plot, mm. on the other hand, was a little bit left, which on some of them were a little bit more um, of the issues. Well, you'll notice I didn't mention the scripts. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I thought that um, you just left that one go through there, <laughs> through there Dan. Well, uh, well, Steve, you're a you're a fellow English teacher. Um, what's what was your thought of the the writing? Yeah, um, that, we can do that in point number three, where we've got the negatives and low points. Um, <laughs> well, okay. Well, what did you think of the art? We both wax lyrical about it. Would I think the agree? art was good. From um, mine is still in the sealed packages at the moment. I didn't get have a chance to open them up, um, but from memory. Um, what you're saying, the the pictures were nice, big, and clear. That's what I remember. Yeah, uh, that's that, that's what I put, tucked away in my memory bank. Um, a nice, big, clear. I've just recently picture. opened one page, and then there's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so that, yeah, I'd say the art is great. Um, some of the storylines are, you know, pretty simplistic in in a lot of lot of the sense. Um, some some aged well. Mm. -hmm. And then others, like um, from memory, there was one where there was a, like a lot of them were created in the 60s. I can't remember which one it was. Um, like, for instance, this one here, which is in issue one. Um, I couldn't find my issue one. I was a little bit shattered. The Valley of the Giants. Uh, like, you know, that was a little, that was a little bit wrong in a little bit bits. Like, for instance, like just like some of the story telling was a little bit feel a little bit dated uh there was another one in issue 10 11 or 12 i believe it was one of those ones where there was some mental mentally estranged uh patients mm. uh oh found as well 10 uh a storm of madness so it's, it was a great example of the stories being a product of their time mm. um so you know there was a couple of those type of stories that felt a little bit cringy yeah like, I probably didn't have so much of a problem with that element of it because as a fandom fan, you've got to, you've got to be a little bit used to that. Um, yeah, even the, sure. the Lee Falk stories, um, as Matt Kine pointed out in the podcast that he's just done for us and the, the brilliant video that he produced about um, the singing brotherhood, the first story, you know, you, the, you've got to be prepared for a little bit of historical cringiness mm. if you're reading fandom comics. So I didn't, I didn't really have too much of a problem with that. Although i take your point that, that, um, Madness one was particularly um, galling, I suppose, when you read it through twenty twenty eyes. But, yeah, um, yeah. But that, but they are they're they're from fifty sixty years ago. A lot of these stories in a different country too, and in a different culture. So yeah. it's not um, in, in one sense, it's not fair for us to to judge them on that that stuff. And and I guess um, while I'm on it, it's probably not fair for uh, for me to certainly judge them through an English teacher's eyes either, because they were written by Italians and then translated and. Um, so who knows what the original um, gist of the story would have been if it had been written in English in the first place. So I certainly don't mean to, to um, degrade or, or down trump, downplay the quality of the stories on that level either. I've sort of got to park my, uh, park my job to the side for a little bit while I <laughs> engage in the fantasy of a, of a fandom comic. Wasn't, yeah. there one, wasn't there one story, um, I can't remember which one, but instead of calling Phantom the Phantom, they kept calling him like the Masked Stranger or the Masked Shadow or whatever, because yeah. that's the way it literally translated. Yes. But it actually meant the Phantom. So. Yeah. Yeah, there was a couple of like, I was picking up spelling and grammar mistakes and stuff. And if I could do it, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you're right in saying that you, you almost have to put that to the side. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it overall. Um, the, po the biggest positive would have to be the exposure to artists that I had only seen in my French comics and I've actually been able to s read the stories in English now. 
that has to be the biggest positive of the whole series, in my opinion. And and for regular readers who don't have access to the French comics, yeah. this is the first time certainly I or I guess Stephen yeah. and, and Australian readers would have ever seen this artwork full stop. So yeah, yeah, you probably you know probably I'll say probably eighty five to ninety percent of the people that of through readers and whether that's in Australia or overseas, I've probably never seen a Fratelli Sparty um, comic before. Well, so. I've got one French comic, I think. Yeah. Oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen's going to go try and find it, I think. But yeah, <laughs> you, you're right. Is majority, majority of readers have never seen it before. Now their eyes are opened. Um, so uh, I, think that's, I think that's brilliant. I think, you think people, people are going to go, there you go. Yeah, that's a French one. Steve, you're going to have to talk so we can see it. Oh, sorry. I better talk. Um, <laughs> here's my French. It's a Are nice, you big, thick one. Pardon your French or? Yeah, pardon my French. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, look, it's, um, it, it is, it's interesting. What do you think, Jim? Will people, are you, not, you, you said before you're noticing an uptick in the people who are showing interest in um, the art from those stories, yeah. the original artwork. What about um, people who are now cl- interested in collecting the actual comics, the original yeah. Italians yeah. and French? Uh, yeah. Are you feeling like there's an increase in that market as well? Yeah, there is. A lot of it's because, you know, uh, I'll just, hang on. I'm just, so for instance, I'm just grabbing a couple here. Those are on YouTube, you can see it. I'm in the middle of balding and bagging my comics, my French ones, so that's why they're easily accessible. But you know, some of these covers, I'm not sure. Can you see that good? Yeah. Some of these covers are absolutely amazing. Um, you know, they're painted. They're in the style of, you know, Rolf Golf's, um, uh, you know, um, Aslan Suker and uh, even Antonio Lemus where they're, you know, that style. Mm. Um, and so if you kind of like those artworks, you'll um, probably like these ones. Right? And then, so you've got the painted ones. And then you've got a lot of the line art ones as well. So, like, there's a good mixture. And you can buy covers. You can buy the original artwork from the stories and stuff like that as well. And, you know, they're not super expensive, but they're not super cheap. But, you know, there's, you know, there's some good ones to, to pick up. Um, just one sec, guys. That's right. uh, so, for instance, I'll just show you this here. So this is a bit of a brag and tell, but... The one in the middle is uh, a, a Fratelli Sparta, um, uh, you know, cover as well. Uh, original, from original, the cover? yeah, original from the cover. So you know, um, is that as uh, uh, that's Aslan Sukar? Uh, no, Aslan Sukar's this one over here. Okay, just the Turkish one, and the one in the middle is Mar- Mario Carrier. I've, oh, know, yeah. I've butchered that name as well, and then there's a, a Rolf Goffs. To the other oh, just a, just a rough goss. Yeah. Hitting on the side there. <laughs> and, and we should say, obviously, um, we're, we're recording this only a couple of days after we uh, learned that Rolf has passed away. So uh, an appropriate moment to just um, acknowledge him and, and his work. And um, oh, I'm jealous that you have one of his covers, uh, Jermaine, because while there's 900 plus of them out there, there's not going to be any more. So um, you've done very well. Yeah, thanks. So I think the positive has to be in my opinion, with the series has to be the uptaking of, of readers being interested in the series, whether it's just collecting them, whether it's wanting to get more of the Phantom's world or whether it's collecting the comics and all the art. So I think that has to be the positive, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. Well, we've lost Steve. He's now trying to... Yeah, I just, I've actually been looking at the art. It's, they're they're um, folk stories. Yeah. And this, and, um, I was actually just the whole collection, and I was checking out the covers. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's like a bound book top. Yeah. yeah. Ah, it's, it's actually <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> first time you've ever opened it, is it? <laughs> well, I flicked through it. But that's about it. Well, when I knew, when I got it for an absolute bargain, I didn't stick around for them to uh, up the price. Change their mind. <laughs> so stick normal, around, too heavy. <laughs> normally, we lose Stephen when he falls asleep. And now, uh, <laughs> Not when he falls into a book. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, where were we up to? Uh, oh, we'll the high points. Yeah, yeah, the positives. <laughs> You're running this, remember? Yeah, I know. Um, and I can't really add any much, much to it because, yeah, like you said, being able to um, see these books and um, these stories and this art and 
and yes, yeah, these story lines from from overseas just to see what they've been up to. Um, I remember when when it was first announced, it was with excitement because we're going to get these things from from overseas and we'll be able to read them because they're in our language. Um, and then um, we came to a well, I came to a bit of a crashing halt when we actually could be able to read them and uh, some of them weren't that good. Um, and I remember, and it, and, it, and it took me like a little while to to read them after I purchased them. Like usually when I purchase a comic, I, I read it that day or within, you know, by the, by the day after. Um, but a lot of times with Phantoms World, it might st- stay there for a month before I picked it up. Um, mm. and that, particularly after, it was after... Um, Queen of Saba. Yeah. Is that Queen of Saba, that one? Yeah. Yeah. After that, I, it, it, it pretty much lost me from then. Mm. Um, and I know you guys, oh, you were chirping about um, The Haunted Castle, I think, um, but I still haven't read it. I still haven't got myself around to, to read it. Um, having, but not, not everything's bad. Like, that's an absolute banger, using today's yeah. language. Absolute banger. But yeah. I'll talk about that one later. Um, any other low points for you guys or negatives? It probably has to be the Queen Sala series, unfortunately. Mm. It lost uh, me. It really did. It, 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 it did. Um, it, it almost felt like the Phantom was kind of shoehorned in, um, you know, like that film Ang had this story and then he's like, I want to draw this story, but how do I get this story sold? Oh, let's add the Phantom in and we'll put some random guy in the Phantom outfit and then, you know, I'll be able to sell it to through mm-hmm. and then they'll, you know, buy it and publish it. Um, it didn't quite happen like that, but um, it, it it's unfortunate because the the artwork was was good. The artwork, you know, it was not at its best, but it was very it was good. It was very passable, but I just couldn't get into the storyline because the Phantom was so unphantom like, mm. um, and even with um, uh, where is it uh, kidnapped and. Um, which one was it? Uh, Seinfeld, which was the first two-part series that we got, um, which was a new one. Like, there was just slight little things like the Phantom was calling Sarah Cartwright Miss Mist the whole time. And it's like, that was her rotor password. And I know, I know the, the, the nickname or the, the alias might be, you know, sexy and mysterious and stuff like that. But she's not Miss Mist. She is Sarah Cartwright. Mm. Um, and I, I just so it was just little things like that that just kind of irked me a little bit. And then when you've got um, Miss Mist at the end, you know, trying to you know kiss the Phantom and, and mm. stuff like that, it was just it was just a little bit unnecessary. Um, which and it almost felt like and I, and I hate saying this because I'm a huge filming fan, huge filming fan. You know, mm. and we've all got his original artwork and, you mm. know, we all love what he does. Love it, it almost tainted his legacy and also the Phantom's World legacy. Look, I can't, I can't really, those are very strong words, but it's hard to disagree with them. I, um, I don't know if tainted is, it might be too strong. It took the shine off perhaps for me. Yeah, that's probably um, a better word. Just, um, I, I think... The way that Phantom's World, and I said to us, I said before, the way that it was sold to us, and we've all talked about it, was that it was going to be um, stories that we hadn't seen from around the world. And what I, what I probably, in certainly in retrospect, didn't enjoy was the new stories, the ones that have been yeah. purpose written for Phantom's World. I think that they were would have been better served by continuing to just bring back the stories from. What about 40, that one? Yeah, that's the the Angelo Todaro is probably the exception. Um, yeah. Because that was a good story, but the, well, the both, other... there was th- two stories, two parts, and a third story, and I think yeah. they were both very good. But I've, yeah. I particularly remember that one. I suppose the issue for the Angelo Todaro one yeah. um, as, as being the the better maybe chapter or part of that story. Um, Queen Saba uh, was where Fan was all jumped the shark for me. It was just it was a bridge too far for all of the reasons you've said, Jermaine. It was a it was not a good Phantom story and it was there for three issues, including half, like 50 pages of the first issue and it just kept going and going and it was 
we read it and I think I might have even said at the time I pushed through it just because I knew I was recording it for the podcast but if not for that I oh, it was so bad I don't know that I even would have flicked through it to see what the pictures looked like it was really well I did not enjoy it I gave it another go for in preparation for this podcast you know do my due diligence and I enjoyed the artwork and there was panels that and little nods to past, um, you know, past phantom stories and past pieces of artwork that Phil Mang's done. And I enjoyed that, you know, really enjoyed the little tidbits and the little Easter eggs and, and the nods and all that. But I still couldn't get into the story. And I hate so, reading the dialogue and just look at the pictures and skim past the dialogue. I um, no, the story. I, 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 you know, I, I gave it a go, you know, and I, you know, I wanted to be proven wrong. I wanted to be able to say, Oh, I actually really enjoyed the story. Um, you know, I, because like I said, I'm a huge filmmaking fan, but mm. I, I, I couldn't. And, you know, I gave it another go, um, you know, a couple of years after it. And yeah, I just, I just couldn't get into it. Which, which is sad, and I think your terminology was a better way of doing it. It, it took the shine off uh, Phil Mang's legacy, but also off the, the Phantom's world. Um, mm. And that, and the shame of it was that that was so early. I think what was that? Yeah, it was five, six, seven, or something like that. Yeah, which um, and that's so sort of halfway through, and it really, really um, put a hole. I, I don't know what the sales figures were like, but um, certainly it sounds like um, my view would be representative. After that, you weren't really excited about the Phantom's World coming out. Yeah. I wasn't. I bought them but didn't read them. There you Just, go. Well, there you go. Um, um, but we all agree that the Angela Todera news, news stories was, which is this one. Here. I did enjoy that. Absolutely did enjoy yeah. that. For, for me, I don't know what's a news story and what's not. They're all news stories because I've never read them before. <laughs> so I just <laughs> call them all news stories. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, now, but, um, you, oh, sorry, sorry keep going. Oh, I was just going to say, um, Dan made a good point about when the series was announced, it was, you know, Phantom Comics from around the world. Um, you know, we saw this one here, which was a, a, um, an RGE or a Brazilian story, which I really enjoyed this story. It was a long story that literally the whole comic is that one story, but you know, I, I'm not sure whether all the other RGE stories were at this level or not, but um, mm. it would have been nice to see a couple of other stories from maybe Bastia, which is the German publisher, and, and maybe the Brazilian one as well. So, so that one's a good, uh, a good issue. Yeah, because, number eight. Um, the cover's not good anyway. Yeah, and, and, this, and this is where my point is going. You know, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but I look at that and think, ah, oh, I'm not really keen on seeing what's in there after if that's the quality of the cover. Yeah, um, which, which, is, which is sad because he's a very... He's a, uh, this is Wilma... Um, what was Amaral? It? Yeah, Wilma Amaral. Yeah, or however you want to say that. I'm going to butcher it. Um, but he's a, he's a very popular artist in Brazil. Uh, I've got a sketch cover from him, which you might be able to see behind me. And the sketch covers, or the sketch covers that I've seen him do leaves this cover for dead mm. um so and he's, and then, the, he's the story artist as well for operation yeah. brazil and the, and the story is really readable so yeah that's quite enjoyable really clean yeah i did hear that it was hard uh with the translation and stuff so i wonder if that might be the reason why we only saw the one maybe the translators of free can do italian but they can't do Portuguese or German. So maybe that might have had something to do with it. Yeah, that, that, that would be... And I don't, I'm no longer looking at the run sheet, Steve, so I'm probably jumping all over the place. But in terms of um, a disappointment, I guess, with, uh, with Phantom's World, that would be it, that we didn't see more from around the world. Um, there was lots of Italian, which was great, mm. um, but not enough from Baste, from, more from RGE, um, you know... There's a South African comic I've heard, so whether we could have seen uh, seen that <laughs> come into Phantom's World as well, uh, um, that's just that's just reprint newspaper story. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but nice uh, nice try of getting that one in. <laughs> With number eight here, like you, who who did you say was the um the the illustrator? The, the you just want me to butcher his name again? Oh, but, but <laughs> it's not Farmer. 
Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I looked at that and thought, oh, that's Felmang again. Yeah. And, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just looked at, oh, Felmang's had a bad day. And <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, it reminded me of that re- rejected yeah. Phantom Girl art that he'd done. Mm. Have a have a read of it, Stephen. I yeah, think I'll, you'll I'll, enjoy it. it. It's long. I do plan on reading them. It's just it's I'm yeah. Going to get a chance to now. It's uh, it, it's a long story, but it it's been voted <laughs> as like the best RGE story, and every Brazilian fan that I've talked that I've talked to and dealt with with collecting and all that, they always talk about this story. So it's it's kind of like the jewel, and I think a lot of the reason is because the phantom actually visits Brazil. Hmm. You, know, um, you know, there's there's a scene in there where um, he's with the he's in a carnival, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, well, um, King's Cross, the King's Cross connection is more popular than it deserves to be for the quality of the writing because that's got the Phantom <laughs> coming to Australia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it when he comes to your country, yeah, yeah. So that that page there is you know the Phantom in for those who are on YouTube you to see this. Um, this is a you know carnival. Uh, so you know you've got your people dancing, you get your girls in bikinis and uh, and stuff like that, and then you've got a you know an eight ten year old. So um, you know, which I didn't realise that the Carnivals are a good family outing for um, for an eight or ten year old. Ah <laughs> uh, dear. So what do we reckon? It's like, it's like it's been uh, twelve issues of the specials, and was it three or four in the um, in the normal? Four, yeah. So sixteen. Four. Was it a success? I think yes. Dan? Uh, I would have said no. Um, and the proof of that is in the fact that it stopped. If it was a success, it would still be going. Um, it, it, I didn't quite serve the purpose that it came out to say, which, as, as we've said, was for us to see stories from around the world. Um, it wasn't quite what I expected when we started seeing stories that were purpose-written for it, as I've said. Um, and so if those sort of things probably... Um, took it in a direction that I hadn't seen, realised, and 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 look, and, and as, as I say, it stopped. So, yeah, I I I don't think these stories were purposely written and drawn mm-hmm. for Phantom's World. I think they were more um, like created, and then Fru had them, and they didn't know what to do with them, so they thought, oh, they're from Italy. Let's chuck them in Phantom's World. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. I think. That concern is probably more of a, a uh, if you have to do it, probably more of a through editorial decision that might have missed the mark. Maybe because the older stories, and if they were first published in the sixties or seventies, they had a they had an excuse for being bad. Um, <laughs> well, they had a, yeah, they past. had an excuse for the you know because some stories some stories don't date well. Mm-hmm. But you know, I've been I've been really listening to the. Yeah, and Fork, yeah, heaps of his stories don't yeah. don't read well now. And, and I don't want to come across too negative either because there were lots of the Italian stories that I really yeah. enjoyed. Some of the, um, probably the simpler plots, the ones where they didn't try to get too complicated and mm. just tell a short story in across six to eight pages. Some of those stories. I oh, really- yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a point that I actually made is, um, that was the point I was going to make in uh, point seven is... Uh, Stephen, do you want to say point seven before I take over your job? <laughs> uh, well, would you like to see more? Uh, probably not as a, a standalone series, but to throw them into the um, the, the normal through numbering, um, yes, it would be great to see um, comics from around the world just in the usual through thing. Um, you know, if we get one or two a year, maybe as a um, I don't know, backup in a hundred special, if you like. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I wouldn't mind seeing a. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing it again. Like, I understand the four issues is probably a, a four issues a year. It might be a bit much. Whether they do it as an annual or maybe even you know, and then just print a small run and just release it via the website because I'm assuming it's mainly just the hardcore fans that will probably be interested. Um, Dan, you made a brilliant point about the eight-page stories. Uh, six and seven um, had two brilliant, really enjoyable eight-page stories. Uh, mm. Queen of the Apes, um, which, which was done by Senior Parazzi, uh, which is there, you can see it as I'm flicking through. 
you know, the art's enjoyable. It's a nice, simple story. Uh, that was eight pages. That could quite, uh, this one had the elephant's memory. Isn't that exactly the amount of pages that they need to turn a, um, uh, an Egmont story into a Fru comic yeah. book? Yeah, yeah. So mm. maybe... They'd be, they'd be awesome as fillers. They, you yeah. know, yeah. Instead of Heart of Darkness, for instance... Well, that's um, almost finished as well. So yeah, yeah, but you, but that's my point. And I, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, you could have a couple of the eight-page ones, and then you could rotate with, you know, say like Gaslight. Uh, you could have um, Paul Mason with his Vietnam stories as well. Mm. He's well, told us more of those. It has been a while. Yeah, he's told us previously that he's created a couple of eight-page stories, and mm. you know, so you know, all of a sudden, you know, if you can find another half a dozen of, of Fratelli Sparty eight page stories, add in a couple of gaslights, add in a couple of um, things. There's, you know, there's a whole year's worth of eight page yep. fillers yeah. um, that you could use. So I would like to see more. Um, I'm not sure how they would do it. I don't think we have the room in the regular series with that now going down to, what is it, 25 or 28 issues? Um, maybe an annual, like a 300 page once a year you know, 20 bucks on the website or, you know, I'm not sure if that would work, but um, it would be sad not to see more of these stories uh, printed in English. Mm, mm. I guess it depends at the end of the day, it depends on the business um, aspect of it, yeah. doesn't it, for free, whether that would uh, sell enough to warrant the, the, the print run. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so and that's a good point. And we've seen with through. They're not afraid of making a hard decision like that. No, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've talked about that previously, but if there's a hard decision and it's not making their money, they, they will get rid of it, which they have to. They're, yeah. They have to make money. Yeah. And Fru was doing that in the 50s when Giant Size wasn't working for them then So and Super Yanks. You know, they those were comic um, extra series that they tried and didn't work and, um, so they can, and now they're super collectible. So, Stephen, you need to find where your number one is for yeah, Phantom's World. Number one. 40 years from now, people will be like, oh, did Phantom's World number one, have you got that? I do. Yeah. Games well, will be bagged and boarded, and people will be horrified because mine's in a binder. <laughs> <laughs> look, um, it's labeled Phantom's World. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually uh, quite, kind of lucky. I've got a couple of mine actually signed by Phil Mang, So um, Oh, that's good. There you go. So uh, um, I think those ones might but not not number one though, sorry, uh, Stephen. So, <laughs> <laughs> nah, well, that's all good. Um, but I was just thinking, what was I thinking? Yeah, I, I don't see there any be there any problem about putting it into the regular series. Um, you know, worldwide stories. There's nothing saying that Fru can't just pu- should just be publishing Australian created fo- and then folk stories and or newspaper stories and um, anything that comes out of Scandinavia. Mm. Um, the Phantom's world is bigger than that. And um, so, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing them. Like you said, maybe it's the eight-page filler at the back of a of a um, Scandinavian story. Mm. And, and that said, I know that um, you talked about. Yeah, where I, put it? I know that you talked about how long this story was, Jim. But uh, Operation Brazil was probably my favourite story from the series. Um, I really liked how long it was and the twists and turns and the winds. It reminded me of uh, of, uh, of an old school Lee Fork. Mm. Um, story the Sunday the daily or whatever that might go for nine or 12, ten months. Um, it just it kept going and the story filled, filled out and fleshed out and wandered along and I really enjoyed that aspect of this story. So yeah, so yep. would that have been your best issue then? The op- yeah, no, a hundred percent. Cover aside, we'll, I, I think we're going to talk about covers separately. But um, in terms of uh, favorite issue, yeah, definitely that would be this one. Uh, Operation Brazil number eight. Right. Yeah. Mine's number. Mine's number four. Um, for, and, I've, and I've written down here because um, it's the one I remember for the right reasons. I just remember, you know, I looked at it and I thought, oh, didn't think too much of the cover. I thought, there's two things, it's just a bit going on. I thought, I'm, I'm not going to like this. And then after I read it, I was thinking, that's a hell of a lot better than what I thought it was going to be. Mm. And um, so that's my favourite, the, the An- Angelo Todaro um, special. I thought yep. that one was excellent. Yeah, no. So those two were actually some of my favourites as well. But the other ones that I thought are worthy um, of uh, discussion are Fan as well, number nine and number 10. And in my opinion, the collection of stories in these are actually some of the best that we've actually seen from the series. So 
like mm. when I reread them and, you know, I reread every issue in preparation for this podcast and stuff like that. I, you know, sometimes you kind of flick through it and go, yeah, no, this story's boring, kind of flick over. But then I actually read all the stories and went, oh, I enjoyed that story. I enjoyed that story. I enjoyed that story. I enjoyed all the stories in that issue. So for me, yeah, the, apart from the two that you just mentioned, these two were, would be my other favourites. Mm. Yeah, and look, imagine if those two books had been um, issues five and six, for instance, instead of getting Queen Saba. That would have given Phantom's World a, a whole different energy, I think. So, because um, I agree, those were two, two great compilations of books. And I remember when we were talking about them, reviewing them on the, the Comics and News podcasts, that um, uh, we commented then how much better the stories had suddenly yeah. improved and whatever. So, yeah. If they were done as five and six, I would have read them by now. <laughs> <laughs> but alas, I haven't. So, really, I, I, I'm cutting half with um, what I can say my favourite stories are. I'm just going to go with this one because it's the one I remember. Yeah, it's fair <laughs> oh, enough. For those, oh, sorry, for those who are listening, and rather, uh, it's the um, Hong Lung uh, series. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. It was very, it was very enjoyable, and the second story was enjoyable as well. And um, yeah, so I think, and they were, and they kind of matched up. So you know, the, the stories matched up together as well. Like, and the third one, all the. The second story, which was the third part, if that kind of makes sense, was actually written by Pity Anderson. And I would like to get him on the podcast and he can actually describe this in more detail. But I believe the story goes that he presented the story, the plot, and then they were like, well, hang on, we've got this other story. How about you change the beginning a little bit so it looks like it actually dovetails at the end of the Hong Long series? So um, if I've got that correct, that's a brilliant way of doing it and good editorial change from um, from Fru as well. Mm-hmm. Cool. What about you, Dan? What was your, uh, well, we already know that your Operation Brazil was your favourite. Do you have any runners-ups? Oh, probably those nine and ten that Jermaine has said, just for the reasons that, um, you know, good compilations of stories and we started to see some, um, some really good, you know, I, I think, as I said, um, that Glenn... Ford as editor has brought together a good um, selection of stories. And I think probably early in the piece, he was focused on the art that he liked. Um, later on, towards the end of the series, I, that's when I enjoyed the, the quality of the stories more. The art was, you know, unquestionably good. We've said that right throughout the series, but the, the stories themselves got better towards the end. So it was, it was a shame, really, that it finished um, as it did, as the quality of the comics, in my opinion, was starting to improve. Mm. All right, Jermaine. Do, so um, I've got a list together, Stephen. So, <laughs> and this is for you and for others who have maybe given up a little bit on this series. Yeah, let me find my pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you're listening to this and you and you're like, maybe I need to give this series a, a bit better of an idea. I want to name some stories that stood out to me, and then I want to let you know what issue they come in. All right, I've got my pen, I've got my pad, I'm ready to go. All righty So this one here, the Venus of the Jungle, which is Fru 1761, oh, that, that stands out to me. And I, actually, I reread it and I'm like, I actually really enjoyed that. And it probably is my favourite cover and probably one of my favourite stories as well. Um, Scandal in High Society, which is in Phantom's World 1, um, is... It's it's kind of it's weird. It, it it it's Diana being sick and not knowing who the Phantom is, and then the Phantom gets set up by the paparazzi for having an affair with someone, and then you've got the Phantom's, uh, and then you've got Diana's mum causing all sorts of havoc as well, and it's just it's it's just it's it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit left field, but there's a lot of Phantom tropes in there, and I really enjoyed it. Um, in issue two, Fans World 2, there's uh, Play With Fire, uh, which is kind of like in the middle. So basically, you got some bad guys. They set up a bushfire, um, and then all havoc goes loose, and then the Phantom has to chase them, you know, through the jungle on a boat and, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, it's it, I enjoyed it. It stood out to me. Hong Long, which we've talked about um, in number five, Racing the Devil, which is actually what's attributed to the cover here, which has got the Phantom racing a 
a black story, so a black horse. So if you've liked stories where the Phantom has to do racing, horse racing and stuff like that, the story's very similar as some of the previous ones we've seen that. It's clean, it's simple, but it's enjoyable. Um, in issue six, which is the Queen of the Apes, which is a nice little uh, eight-page story. Uh, in number seven, the return of Grover. Now, do you guys remember who Grover is? Yeah, he's a muppet from Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> no, Baron Grover was um, Roy Moore um, era bad yes. guy. So I'm not sure if you can see that on the video, but there's a panel of Grover. He was from the Seahorse, I believe it was, or the Shark's mm. Nest, mm. one of those stories. And do you remember Big Steve? Yeah, I thought that that story was really well done because that was, uh, you know, is part of what Fruel is also doing. That was a sequel mm. to mm. to a folk story. Um, I thought that was, again, you know, how good would that have been as the eight page filler at the end of a reprint of the the story that it was? Yeah, the yeah. So it was the Shark's Nest, and that was last published in Fru number one six nine two. Probably, so, too, I suppose, for another reprint. But yeah, um, yeah, but it's a it's a very valid point. Um, so it's a, it's a, a likable bad guy, or, or yeah. an undespicable likable bad guy, um, and it's a little short little sequel story. So I, th- I seem to remember. Oh, I seem to remember we didn't. I know I, I didn't reread these for the podcast, but um, I seem to remember we didn't. I didn't necessarily like the way Diana was in it, or, or maybe the Diana was the own was superheroine and Phantom stood back all the time. Yes, that's it. So the Phantom was more in the background in this yeah. type of story, which I actually liked because it yeah. gave the chance for the fan or no, sorry, Diana to actually that's, shine yeah. and not just be a damsel in distress. Damsel in distress. Yeah, I mean, I knew it was something about Diana. Um, yeah. But yes, that and I, and I quite like that story. I've got fond memories of that one. Yeah, and so there's one that stands out for you. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, in issue nine, Phantom as well, nine, there is Witness for the Prosecution. I'm just showing up the first page there if you're on YouTube. Um, the, it's, it's done by a Scotty or Biscotti, if you like an Italian biscuit. Um, it's nice big panels. Um, and so, yeah, so I enjoyed that story. The Phantom is actually not very much seen in his costume. He's mainly in his... Um, uh, Mr. Walker outfit. And then, you know, there's a very, you know, if you look at the last two panels, you'll see, you know, uh, the Phantom and Diana kissing in the uh, garden and Lily, Diana's mum, you know, is going, oh, why are we still stuck with him type of thing? So there's a lot of different, you know, um, uh, tropes in that story as well. Now, Phantom as well 10. Now, I'm not sure if you guys remember when I said before that had, in my opinion, some of the more, Mm. Uh, the good collection of the stories. Now, mm. this, apart from the first story, which was the madness one, which we talked about at the beginning, the previous, the next three, four stories are actually all related. So it's like an ongoing saga. Um, so you've got, you know, a strange assassination, and then there's like three, four stories. So the Phantom gets tricked to us try and assassinate someone. The Sing Pirates are involved. and So there's like about three or four stories that are all connected and we get them all at once. So they, they stood out very well and I really enjoyed them. And then the last one I want to point out is in Phantom's World 12, which is the Wild Olympics, which is the story about the Olympics. Um, oh, featuring... I read that one. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have said it was so good, so I did. I did yeah. read that one. <laughs> you shouldn't so, sound so surprised, Steve, on a <laughs> podcast that you've read a Phantom story. <laughs> so there's that one was good. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a dozen stories that, in my opinion, stood out for me. Um, and you know, I'll, if I'll, what I'll do is I'll add that list to um, to the article as well. So. If and, you... and just so people know, on our run sheet, it says here, pick your three best stories. And I've got one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine here that, are, that Jam's just... Actually, not, it's more than nine. It was... He's picked three for each of us, Steve. <laughs> and, 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 and this one actually had three stories. So, yeah, so, you know, so it's up to uh, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> um, so, uh, so if you're driving and you can't be writing that list down, we'll include it with the show notes. 
<laughs> okay. What about your best artists? Okay. Did you guys want to have a bit of a go, seeing I just spent the last five minutes talking? <laughs> well, there's only two artists I know that were in there, and that was Tadero and um and um filming. So, but you guys tell me who your favourite artists were because I don't know who they were in <laughs> for me. Oh, I'm I'm still going to say filming. He's a brilliant um, storyteller with his with his um, pictures. Um, uh, I know that uh, one of the one of the later ones, um, the haunted castle. There's some controversy about um, the 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 censoring or the editing that had to be done of uh, Diana's or is she Diana's costume and putting on oh, uh, yeah. active wear underneath her skimpy uh, top. Um, but we, we love the way that Felmang draws and the way he depicts the Phantom, but the way he de- depicts a beautiful woman as well. And um, I think part of the problem with Queen Saba was he was so besotted with Queen Saba and, and how beautiful she was, um, and she was. So, um, no, I, I love Felmang's artwork. There's lots of great work from the Italian artists, but so many of them, and and, um, and I didn't go back and read every comic like uh, Jermaine did, so he'll probably pluck someone obscure from issue nine or something like that but uh <laughs> as, as, as a whole package filming for mine um but really enjoyed the artwork as i've said all along yeah right, Jim, i'm timing it you got 30 seconds okay <laughs> senio parazzi and antonio scotty uh would be the two obscure ones that you were waiting for me to pick up that <laughs> i've got i like i enjoy angela Tadera and you know and i love filming I've said that a million times. So I, I wanted to focus on this one on artists that I wasn't familiar with. Rick, Ten seconds. That really, really spoke to me, and I enjoyed. And those two will be it. Excellent. Well, then you partly fair to him cool. that he used the first fifteen seconds just to get the two names out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say comment, but then I was just going <laughs> to take up more of his time. <laughs> Don't stumble over the word, mate. Seconds are <laughs> going. Now, what I'll do now is I'll share this. I'll share my screen again, and we'll put the covers back up for when we do it. We've got our favourite covers, so I'll bring that up. Okay, um, June. Favourite okay. colours. All right, so you know, I'm just trying to find one of them. Okay, so one seven six one, which is the Venus of the Jungle. Um, Really enjoy that cover. Like you know, there's you know, there's action on it. There's and it kind of gives you a bit of an idea of the story. And I, I just, it's busy, which might not you know be everyone's take, but I enjoyed it. Um, so that would be one of the covers. Phantom's World number five, um, which is the Phantom and the jockey with Diana in the background. Really like that whole type of concept type of thing. And then the other one would be Phantom's Well number 12, which is the, um, uh, the last one, which for those who um, may not know, this was actually a cover created um, by Filmang and someone else, which I can't remember, but it was actually created for a Team Phantom Man story. And it's also the case for... Um, there was another one or two as well. Phantom as well, number nine and number 10 were also created for um, uh, Team Phantom in comics and then repurposed for Thrill as well. So they're, they're my favourite three. Cool. Um, I would agree uh, five and 12 are definitely um, in my top three, as well as this one here, which is Phantom's World number three. I just like the, the look of that one. Um, yeah. It's got that like pulp noir yeah. look, and I really enjoy that one. What about you, Dan? Uh, mine are all taken. Um, my top three, my uh, my god, my my bronze and silver went to the two covers that featured Hero. I don't know. I've just got a soft spot for any action shot that features Hero. So that's issue uh, five and issue twelve, as uh, both of you guys have mentioned. Um, but my favourite of of all of them is from issue three. Um, from Jamana Ferry, um, yeah. I, I, I really like. I think this um, is a different style. Whether I, I'm not smart enough to know whether it's painted or uh, watercolor or enamels or whatever it's acrylics, whatever's been used. But um, I really love the 
the shade of Ferry's work here, the colour that he's used, the the posing, and just the different the different feel to that cover. So um, yeah, that that would be my favourite of the of the bunch. Mm. Very good. So what um, do you think? Oh, oh, so I was just going to ask, what did you guys think about through reusing the covers? Like, what was it nine, ten, and twelve? Wasn't an issue for me. Yeah, and do you, is that because you hadn't seen him before on a on a Fancy yep. Man comic? And it's like, this is an amazing cover, so why shouldn't we see it? It doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. No, I, I'm exactly the same. I reckon it was a good idea to include it. Uh, again, maybe 20% of the readers have probably seen it before. But if that, maybe even less. But, you know, I, I enjoyed it because it's like, hey, it's a great cover. Yeah. I'm, I didn't know that. And I'm, to be honest, a little disappointed to hear it. Um, I'm glad I got to see it. Um, and... And I feel like issue twelve, especially, I've I've seen that somewhere before. So whether I just remember that because again, I love I love an action uh, shot of hero. But um, I'm a little disappointed to hear that they're not unique covers to to Phantom's World. And uh, I'm with Steve; it's neither here nor there, really. But it's just um, yeah, I, it, it would have been nice if they were all original covers. I wouldn't have minded if they were um, the covers from the original issues. That would have been good too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice, perhaps in the the compilation in particular, to to show the cover of the the original comic. But that is a splash page. Mm. Another another question. I wonder if the reason why these stories stopped being in the regular series is because it was more cost effective to put the it's these artists that are all these covers that are all done in Italy to be separate because then they didn't have to send, send them away to Italy for the signature series. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Which makes sense because it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be uh, cheap sending a hundred of those covers to Italy. No, no, absolutely not. No. <laughs> there, and there was no signature series for Phantom's World. You yeah. may have the only two signed Phantom's World uh, covers that exist, you mate. Yeah, well, I'm sure there'll be a couple of people that will send them off now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, so we come to the end. What, what do you guys think? Um, do you agree with us? Do you agree with our choices for best stories, best artists? Or was this a series that you just didn't really get into? Um, didn't matter if it's a Queen Saga saga or, or, or what. It just wasn't float, didn't float your boat. Um, whatever way you go, you can get in contact with us. Let us know what you think. You can get in touch with us on Facebook at chroniclechamber.com and the Phantom Collector group. That's our Facebook pages. Uh, we're on Twitter at chronicle underscore tweet. Um, we, well, no, is that correct? I've just said someone. Ah, we're good. So Twitter at chronicle underscore tweet. Then we have Instagram at Chronicle Chamber and YouTube. You can find us there at Chronicle Chamber as well. Of course, our website is chroniclechamber.com and you can email us at chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Okay, fellas, it's getting late here. I think it's time to, to wrap it up. Thank you very much for your time and your opinions. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I enjoyed tonight. I really enjoyed talking about the comics from around the world. So uh, I hope everyone else listened to that and enjoyed that as well. Yeah, here, here. It was uh, it was good to sit and talk some fandom with you. So, and um, from me, guys, uh, from sunny, cool Queensland, happy fandoming. <laughs> happy fandoming, Dan. Happy fandoming, Jermaine. I'm happy fandoming. Reading. I've got some reading for me to get up uh, up to now. So, <laughs> happy fandoming, one and all. Five hundred years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, "I'm mad. I must eradicate." Piracy, injustice and cruelty And all my sons will follow me So evildoers will believe That this man cannot die The Phantom The ghost who walks The Phantom Enemies beware The Phantom's always there But you won't find the Phantom He finds you